tissues. And we're going to speak largely uh, in this particular presentation about cells and the organelles that are involved. Now, we have um, the cellular theory, uh, the idea that cells carry out all of the chemical activities that are needed to sustain life. In fact, the idea of the cell theory is that life is derived from cells. All living things are cellular. Um, so cells are the building blocks of all living things. And if it's not uh, cellular in nature, it's not alive. But the cell gives us a place for things to happen. It separates the inside from the outside. It allows us to concentrate materials in one area or another. It gives us a space to work. Now, tissues are a group of cells that are similar in structure and function, derived from the same thing. So when we talk about muscle tissue, we're talking about cells that have specific characteristics, uh, do the same kind of thing, and we will get into tissues and tissue types a little bit later on. First off, let's take a look just at the anatomy of a cell itself and understand that cells are not all the same. We have four major tissue types, each one of them with some unique characteristics, and within that we have something like 200 uh, different subgroups, all with different capabilities based on the organelles they have, internal structures, external structures. So they're not all the same, um, but all cells do share some general structures. All cells have three main regions, for instance. We have the nucleus. We have the cytoplasm, which is this area here. And then we have the plasma membrane, or cell membrane. And those are three distinct regions within a cell. So the plasma membrane is our outer boundary. The cytoplasm is the area between the cell membrane and the nucleus and then the nucleus is a membranous structure which contains our genetic genetic material the nucleus is the control center of the cell it is considered the control center because it contains the genetic material that is dna and the dna gets activated or deactivated depending on the needs of the cell the dna contains a genetic code that alters the activities of the cells. Uh, the genes allow the cell to produce or not produce certain proteins. Now, the cell uh, nucleus itself has a membrane. It has the nucleolus, and the nucleolus is an area where we have a lot of activity going on. We actually have the production of ribosomes. And we'll talk about the necessity of ribosomes shortly later on, but cells must have ribosomes to be able to produce proteins. And then we have the chromatin, and the chromatin is the unwound genetic material. Um, we think of genes as being like X and Y chromosomes and that sort of thing, and those are when we have wound up and packaged this very nicely. Um, my mother used to crochet, and anybody who crochets, you can buy a skein of yarn. Well, that skein of yarn is the wound up DNA. And once you pull all of that thread out and you just have a loose pile of thread on the floor, what you have is the chromatin. This is just a different graphic to kind of show you the structure here. Now, you'll notice that the nuclear envelope has a lot of pores in it, and that serves a couple of purposes. The pores are just big enough for messenger RNA to leave the nucleus, but small enough that DNA cannot exit. That protects the DNA from being broken down by uh, activities going on outside the cell. These pores are also large enough to allow certain hormones to enter 
and bind to parts of the genetic material, turning them either off or on. Now, the purpose then of the nuclear envelope is that it is a barrier to the nucleus. It is double membraned. Um, we talked in chapter 2 about phospholipid bilayer and phospholipids line up to form this bilayer or double membrane. That is what we have in the nucleus. Uh, it has protein pores that allow things to pass through. So most of the organelles, actually uh, all the organelles with the exception of the cytoskeleton, are membranous in nature. They have an inside and outside. It contains nuclear pores that allow for exchange of materials with the rest of the cell. As we said, the nucleoli, um, and depending on the type of cell, a nucleus may contain one or more nucleoli, but these are sites of ribosome assembly. And ribosomes then migrate out into the cytoplasm through those nuclear pores and begin the production of proteins. The chromatin, as I said before, composed of DNA and protein, there are proteins called histones that the DNA winds around when it's packing up a little bit more tightly. But this is present when the cell is not dividing. It's scattered, scattered throughout the nucleus, and by being stretched out like that, it gives easy access to portions of the um, DNA that code for necessary proteins. Once you wind it up into a gene, there's really limited uh, access and activity that can go on. But it does condense and form chromosomes when the cell is about to divide. We'll talk about that division in a different discussion uh, when we get into mitosis. Now, <clears throat> the plasma membrane, that's the outer part of the cell. That's the boundary that separates the inside from the outside of the cell. And it is a complex structure and serves a lot of purposes which we will talk about in um, exchange of uh, uh, nutrients, exchange of uh, cellular components. But in general it serves as a barrier for cell contents. It is that phospholipid bilayer as well. Again, remember, phospholipids have hydrophilic tails, uh, or hydrophobic tails and hydrophilic heads. So they line up in a way that the part that likes water is exposed either inside or outside. And the phospholipid portion is exposed to the phospholipid portion of its opposing uh, phospholipid. It also contains proteins uh, which function as structure, uh, attachment, and transport. It has cholesterol, which is actually a fairly large molecule which stiffens the cell membrane, and glycoproteins, which help identify the cell as ours. We'll talk about glycoproteins more in the immune system. The end result, though, is that about 60% of the cell is made of phospholipids. The other 40% are these materials. A graphic of what this would look like is something like this. And you can see we have these little balls with what look like threads hanging off of them. That's our phospholipid bilayer. And then you see we have proteins that pass all the way through. Uh, some of these act as pores. This one has an opening which allows materials to pass through. Some are structural in nature, just allow something to bind to the surface. You see scattered about these little yellow bits, which are cholesterol. And cholesterol, as I said, it's a big molecule with branches that spread out. So it stiffens the cell membrane a little bit. Um, think of, you know, kind of uh, iron-reinforced concrete. It is the material that holds everything more or less in place. Um, but it's not the major component of, of the concrete in our analogy. Um, we have glycoproteins 
and the glycoproteins are on the surface and they do have little bits of sugar molecules sticking off of them. These are very important in identifying the cell as belonging to us. And this is truly important in the functioning of our immune system. Now, beyond just the proteins that are there, the plasma membrane actually, uh, depending on what it does, may have some specializations. There are projections that can stick off. Uh, we have little folds, little things that stick up, finger-like projections that increase the surface area in some cells for absorption. Uh, think of it kind of like an egg crate uh, mattress. You now it's got little dips and valleys, but that really increases the surface area. And in areas like the digestive tract, where we are trying to absorb nutrients, these things are very helpful. Now they're not on every cell by any means, but they are on a select group of cells that do line our digestive tract. Cilia, these are longer projections, and they actually have some proteins in them that allow them to move. They wave in a rhythmic fashion that will move substances along. Um, we have these in our respiratory tree and these cilia are wafting t upward bringing materials that we may have breathed in uh, uh, into our respiratory tract up into our throat so that we can swallow it. Um, we have mucus there the material binds the cilia move it along. We also, uh, well, women have this in their fallopian tubes. And the egg lands on the cilia. The cilia waft or move that egg along the fallopian tube until it reaches um, the uterus. Now, Let's talk about plasma membrane specializations in terms of junctions. Um, a junction, the basic definition, is a place where two things meet up. And we have tight junctions, which is where we have a very tight binding of one cell to the other. And these are impermeable. They bind cells together into leak-proof sheets that prevent fluids from leaking out. So we would have a lot of these types of junctions say in the bladder which is intended to hold water. We have desmosomes which are anchoring junctions that prevent cells from being pulled apart and they're not quite as tight as tight junctions but they're very strong. Um, it's almost like a nut and bolt running between two uh, different cells. We have hemidesmosomes uh, these are anchoring junctions which attach cells to a basement membrane. So imagine a concrete anchor um, and you have a structure attached to that bolt sticking up from the concrete. And then we have gap junctions and these allow communication between cells and for all the world these things look like the drain in the uh, floor of your garage they allow fluids and electrolytes and other substances to pass from cell to cell. Now what this looks like, if you can see here, we have tight junctions which almost look together like the cells have been sewn or stitched together. And then we have these desmosomes which we have a plaque of protein on either side with protein fibers stretched in between. So it's like a button that's sewn between two sides or a cuff link or something like that. And then you see the gap junctions. Now the hemidesmosomes are generally lying on the bottom and this illustration doesn't show those but they also are like half of one of those desmosomes. This is actually a good place for us to stop. Um, we will pick up on the remaining organelles uh, in our next presentation. And we will touch again on the importance of the cell membrane when we talk about membrane transport. 
So, thank you very much.